Hello and welcome to our preview for the 25th anniversary of the Omega Dubai Desert Classic. Ben Jacobs, the editor of Sports Talk and Robbie Greenfield, the editor of Golf Digest Middle East. It's a highly significant event for the region. It is the Middle East's oldest golf tournament and celebrating its 25th anniversary with all past living champions Tiger Woods, the world number one, and Rory McIlroy, his Nike stablemate, also in attendance here at Emirates Golf Club. Robbie Greenfield, this is quite the occasion and superb to have all of the living previous winners with us. Amazing that they that they got it done, Ben, to, to get all these guys back. Don't forget, this tournament goes back way back to 1989, where Mark James won the first event. So some of these guys won't have actually played competitive golf in a while, but we've just been watching them out there today, and they can still hit it. Absolutely. The tournament begins on Thursday and runs until Sunday and you can get down to Emirates Golf Club and see some of the best in the business. One of them is the world number one, Tiger Woods, but coming off the back of a 79 at Torrey Pines and that's a tournament that he's won seven times and also triumphed at the 2008 US Open there as well. So eyebrows were raised when he went out at the secondary cut in San Diego. Is Tiger rusty? Well, certainly very unusual, Ben, for Tiger to shoot 79. It's um, a course that he's won on eight times before, including the US Open back in 2008. So obviously he's done a lot of work on the off-season. I think we can attribute it to Rust. He looked pretty sharp out there this morning. He was hitting the ball very well on the range. So let's call it an anomaly for now. I mean, we'll see how he performs in the Desert Classic. Let's not forget as well that 12 months ago, Tiger Woods missed the cut in Abu Dhabi and bounced back in his second event of the season, winning at Torrey Pines at the Farmers Insurance Open. So maybe history is about to repeat itself. Well, Rory McIlroy has been in the region a couple of days earlier than one or two of the players, officially opening a Nike store as well here in Dubai. How do you rate his chances? Because this is a sentimental visit for him to the UAE. Not only was he sponsored by Jamira in the past, but the Dubai Desert Classic was the source of his first professional victory. Absolutely, yeah, back in 2009. Rory's got a great chance this week. Went very close in Abu Dhabi. Uh, anyone following that event will have known that he was only really undone by a rules breach on the third round on the second hole. So very unlucky there for Rory, but he's hitting the ball fantastically well. He's had a nice one-week session at the Butch Harmon School of Golf. He missed Qatar last week, and apparently, according to the guys up there, he is absolutely ripping it at the moment. Seemed to be hitting it pretty well in the uh, Champions Challenge a little earlier today, and uh, I think Rory's definitely one to watch this week, Ben. Well, we'll talk about the Champions Challenge and the best of the rest in the field as well in just a moment. Three-time winner Ernie Els is also with us, and 2013 defending race to Dubai champion Henrik Stenson, also part of the field. But before we move on to predictions and some of the other big stars here at Emirates Golf Club, let's talk about this wonderful Majlis course. What are some of the key holes to look out for? Well, the great thing about the Majlis is the back nine, anything can happen. So many swings and momentum. There's three par fives. There's a drivable par four, the 17th. So players can come from deep and actually make a charge, a little like Augusta, and they can come from way back and just shoot straight up the leaderboard. We saw that with Tiger Woods back in 2008 when he shot a 31 on the back nine to win, just nick it off Ernie Els. So a lot can happen on this golf course, and it is in magnificent condition, Ben. The fairways are beautiful. They've done a new bunkering system. They've shaved the edges of the bunkers to make them look a lot neater. And it changes the variety of shots that players can play around the greens. So aesthetically, the Majlis is as good as it's ever looked. And condition-wise, it's as good as it's ever looked, fitting for the 25th anniversary. Well, the busiest man at the moment is the course's chief superintendent, Craig Haldane. But he took the time to catch up with Robbie a little bit earlier. We're here by the 10th green on the stunning Majlis Golf Course. I'm joined by Golf Course Superintendent Craig Haldane. Craig, great to have you with us. It's um, a fantastic looking course this week, as always, for the Amiga Dubai Desert Classic. Just talk a little bit about how you prepare the golf course for this tournament, particularly this 25th anniversary. Uh, thank you, Robbie. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, we've 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 struck it gold this year. Uh, you know, the tournament uh, conditions are, are are superb, and uh, we always strive for that. Obviously, uh, we did a few things differently this year in terms of our overseeding regimes and timings, and particularly around the greens, the the turf variety that we overseeded with, which is Poa Trivialis, which allows us to get these you know these tight runoff uh, areas around the greens. Um, in in the lead up to the event, it's it's really uh, starts way 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 early, and in, uh, in what we do in the summer. Uh, primarily sets us for how we can prepare the golf courses uh, at this time of year. 
um, you know, our verification schedules and uh, you know, to, to get the services, you know, in, in in the condition now, we need to really start start cranking it up quite early. In terms of the detail, you know, we have the ladies' masters, obviously, uh, which we overseeded the rough prior to that this year, uh, and then we overseeded the fairways and approaches after that. So, we had a, a, a difficult situation where we, we were preparing certain surfaces leading into the ladies' masters, and then the the balance after the ladies' masters. Uh, the overseeding is is the most important task we do, and and what you do then, how you prepare. Uh, that and, and the strike that you get will set you for the for the season ahead. And we got a great strike this year, and uh, you know uh, the, the overseas has gone great. The preparations have gone well, and it's really now the last three weeks leading into into this week where where we start the detailed maintenance work. Sure. Now, if you're heading to the golf course this week to watch this fantastic event, the 25th anniversary of the Mega Dubai Desert Classic, you're going to see a Majlis that is in absolutely prime condition. And not only is it in prime condition, but it's also going to be set up for tournament golf, which means firm and fast greens, thick, challenging, rough. But Craig, not only have you got the course presented so beautifully, the greens are running slick, but you've also done some work to the bunkers that we can see here behind us, improving the aesthetics of the golf course. Talk us through the thinking behind that and also how perhaps it's going to play differently for the players? Yeah, I think uh, you know, our, our goal always uh, at Emirates Golf Club is to look at things with a fresh pair of eyes every year and, and how can we enhance what we've got. And the Majesty is iconic in terms of not wanting to change you know, the, the bulk product. Uh, and we spoke a, a few years back about you know, looking at the bunkering and redesigning and you know, all these different things and we eventually realised that you know, don't, if it's not broken, don't don't try and fix it. Uh, however, um, we, we looked at the the concept of having short mown areas around the greens complex and run, running off and in order to achieve that the bunker edges that we had uh, didn't really lend itself to that. So we created the, the edge as far as we felt was necessary in terms of having the runoff and then we brought the edges back to that line uh, which meant some of the longer noses were, were, were kind of you know, made a bit smaller. Uh, we haven't got these long noses and a lot of fly more work in between anymore. And we've got no rough per se between the green the, uh, and the bunker. So it's green, short mode approach and straight into the bunker. Uh, so th the, the edging really is, is the main thing. And the short mown area goes right up to the edge of that of that bunker now. So if you do, you know, if on a firm green now, you know, roll through, uh, the likelihood is that, you know, that if, if we get the surfaces really as tight and, f and firm as we want them, which looks to be the case, that ball should run and trickle off and, and the bunker should be more in play than in the past. Uh, I think over the years, you know, the bunkers just seem to have grown further away uh, and we've brought it back. The whole thing was bring it back to its original, you know, how it was back in the day. Craig Caldane there speaking to Robbie a little bit earlier. So let's focus on some of the other names and it would be remiss to overlook the Spaniards when we talk about the Omega Dubai Desert Classic because along with Sevi Ballesteros and Jose Maria Olathabal, three of the last four winners have come from that particular part of the world. Absolutely, Ben. Yeah, we had Miguel Angel Jimenez winning a playoff against Lee Westwood in 2010. Very dramatic there. Alvaro Quiros, even more dramatic, perhaps, making a hole-in-one in 2011 on his way to a very topsy-turvy victory back then. Long-hitting Spaniard and another Spaniard in 2012. Three on the bounce. Rafa Cabrera Bello, who won in 2012. Wire to wire, he led with a 63 in the first round. And he's on some great form coming into this tournament. And of the perhaps the slightly less marquee names, I would say Rafa is certainly one to keep an eye on. Yeah, Cabrera Bayo playing very steady golf and top five finishes as well at the Abu Dhabi HSBC Golf Championship and Qatar Masters as well. And ahead of the tournament, Robbie caught up with him. I am delighted to be joined by the 2012 Amiga Dubai Desert Classic champion, Rafa Cabrera Bello. Rafa, great to have you with us. Hello, thank you very much. Okay, Rafa. You're back here for the 25th anniversary. You're about to tee off in the uh, the Champions Challenge event. How much does it does it mean to be a champion of this great tournament? Uh, well, I mean, for me, it means a lot. No, I think this is uh, one of the key events on on European tour. I mean, it goes back uh, a long time. I mean, it uh, it was it was the first one uh, of. I mean, the first tournament we we started playing here in the in the Middle East. So, and from then on, this region has has developed uh, golf-wise for us, and it has a, a a very very big impact on on European tours schedule at the moment. So, 
for me being a, 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 champ, a past champion here uh, alongside my compatriots, uh, my hero Sevi, Oli, Jimenez and my friend Alvaro. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it couldn't be any better. I couldn't think of any tournament better to win. Yeah. And if you look at the names on that champions roster, the likes of Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods, of course, who's won the tournament twice, Ernie Els, the only three-time winner, that must fill you with an enormous sense of achievement because you know that you're in great company. Yes, exactly. I mean, just uh, seeing that my name will go down in history uh, alongside theirs makes me feel very special, makes me feel that... Uh, I, accomplish, I accomplished something uh, that was great. So, I mean, and it also gives me the motivation that if I did it once, I can do it again and, and I'm going to work for it. Yeah. That was your second European Tour victory. You've come close in the last couple of weeks. What's it going to take now to get it done this week? Because your golf is obviously in very fine form. I think uh, just a couple of shots less. That's what I've been trailing behind. Uh, no, just uh, that little bit of luck that the, the winners need. Uh, Abu Dhabi, I was leading after two rounds, Qatar the same thing, uh, both days I didn't have a great Saturday, but then I managed to fight back hard, uh, strong on, on, the, on the Sunday, gave myself uh, chances, I was uh, leading uh, in, in Qatar for most of the tournament and uh, in Abu Dhabi I was also leading at some stage in the, in the, in the, final, in the final day, so I think if I just keep put, put myself in that position, uh, a few more times, uh, it'll it'll end up happening. It's just it's just a matter of stats. So I I know I can do it. I've done it before, and I'll do it again. So why not this week? No? Absolutely. Let's look briefly back to the 2012 victory at the Amiga Dubai Desert Classic. You led from the front. You opened with a just an amazing front nine. I think you were seven under par through nine holes, and you kept it going all the way through. But there was lots of drama on that final day, wasn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, anything could happen. I mean, it was a, a, a packed leaderboard. I mean, some big names up there, such as Lee. Uh, I I felt that I was that just me playing in front of of the last group would give me a little edge because coming up the last few holes, we were we were co-leading. It was uh, Steven Lee and and myself. Uh, Marcel was also close as well, but I think the last three or four holes, it just came up to us. So. I knew if I could uh, make a birdie first, it, it feel like a first punch. So uh, I think that uh, I, I I could put some pressure on on them if I managed to make a birdie first, and that's that's what happened. I, I managed to birdie 17, and uh, and that that was that was that seemed to be good enough. I, yeah, a lot of a lot of drama. I took a, a really really risky shot on 16, so uh, it was a very exciting finish. Yes. Talk about that shot because your caddy didn't want you to play it, did he? He wanted you to play the sensible shot out in there, but you overruled him and just went straight through the gap. Yeah, sometimes I, I do silly things. Uh, that was one of them, but this time uh, it worked. It worked out nice. Uh, I, I just felt, I mean, had it been like two, shot, two holes uh, before, I would have done what my caddy advised me to do, which was obviously the sensible play, just knock it on the fairway and try to try to make the putt for, for par. And if not, just take the penalty and, and try to make up on, on the next few holes. But just uh, with there being only two more holes left, uh, I felt that if I bogeyed there, I would lose uh, that I would lose the, the edge and it'd be really, really hard for me to, to win. So I, I really wanted to win. I saw the gap. I went for it and it worked out fine. So I, Absolutely. I'm happy I did it. You managed to birdie as well, the, the 12th, which is always usually one of the hardest holes on the Majlis. When you look at the back nine with three drivable, three, a drivable par four and three par fives, obviously a lot of birdie opportunities. What are some of the key holes that stand out for you on this Majlis course? Yeah, I think that on, on, the, on, the, on the back nine, I mean, the par fives could definitely make a, a very big difference. I think if you uh, manage to hit the fairway in all of them from... On, I mean, on, on any particular day, you're gonna have a very good chance to to go at them in in two, and and that could produce uh, many birdies or even eagle chances. So uh, hitting the fairway on on those three holes in particular, I think may, makes can make the difference because without without hitting the birdie, making without hitting the fairway. Uh, you'll end up laying up in all of them, and it's gonna be much tougher, much tougher to to make birdie. So, yeah, for me, if there's something that makes a difference, it's good driving on the, on the back nine, yes. Mm. Rafa Cabrera Bayo there speaking to Robbie a little bit earlier. And it's been a good start to the Omega Dubai Desert Classic as far as the Spaniard is concerned. Tied with Henrik Stenson, 
in the Champions Challenge. $600,000 at stake and therefore 150000 each as far as those two winners were concerned. So not quite as good as winning the 25th anniversary, but financially almost. Not a bad start, is it? Yeah, for one round it was... Um kind of the, the names that you would expect to see up there but uh, Rafa Cabrera Bello coming in with the form that he's been shown and Henrik Stenson I know he missed the cut in Abu Dhabi but finished last season in just such tremendous form had that incredible year where he earned over 20 million dollars so um, yeah those two uh, are definitely um, some of the big guns this week. A tie, incidentally, if you're wondering why it didn't go to a playoff. Well, technically, it was an exhibition event and a bit of fun. So instead of the winner taking $300,000, $150,000 each instead. Now, normally, we ask for a winner when we make our predictions. And then somebody that might push into the top 10 from a more unexpected point of view. Though on this occasion, I'm going to go for a winner and then a dark horse. But that dark horse has to come exclusively from the champions. Wow, well, you put me on the spot there. I have my dark horse already. Well, I'm going to go for a winner in Rory McIlroy. I think that after his brush with victory last uh, couple of weeks ago in Abu Dhabi, he's ready now. He's hitting the ball so well. He's had such a great off season in terms of his preparation. He's very settled with his bag. He's got a driver that he can hit so far. And I mean, he is just absolutely bombing it out there. I'm going to go for Rory to win on a course that he knows so well. First time he'd ever played a European Tour event was here at the Majlis, let alone the fact he won his first European Tour event here in 2009. So Rory, as my dark horse of the champions, mm, is Thomas Bjorn, does he count as a dark horse? Because I'm going to go for Thomas. If, that, if, if I'm allowed, Thomas, then, uh, you know, I'll take him. And yet you got on so well with Rafa Cabrera Veo and you haven't picked him to win it a second time. Ben, he's not a dark horse. You know, he's coming off a tied third at the Abu Dhabi Golf Championship, a tied fourth at the Qatar Masters. So for me, Rafa is, um, is very much one of the favourites this week. Of the perhaps slightly lesser favourites, I'm going to go with my man Thomas Bjorn. Well, I'm going to make a huge shout and say the world number one Tiger Woods is going to win the 25th anniversary of the Omega Dubai Desert Classic. Loves the big occasion and you never really see him play two tournaments back to back badly when he is fully fit. So much like missing the cut in Abu Dhabi and then winning at Torrey Pines, I think having missed the cut in Torrey Pines in 2014, he will win here at Emirates Golf Club. My dark horse again, there's question marks if you can really refer to him like this, but Ernie Els, three time winner. Can he make it four? I will say no. <laughs> I don't think he can. But uh, obviously a three-time winner, so he knows his way around this track, but he wasn't in great form, I must admit, today. I think he was over par in his round at the Champions Challenge, so he's going to need to pick that up if he's going to figure for the main event come Sunday. Well, do let us know your predictions. You can follow me on Twitter at JacobsBen, and Robbie, your handle is? At Rob underscore Greenfield. And also for more information throughout the event, you can get in touch with Golf Digest Middle East via their Facebook page. The address is? Facebook.com forward slash Golf Digest ME. That's all we've got time for. Enjoy the 25th anniversary of the Omega Dubai Desert Classic running Thursday until Sunday here at Emirates Golf Club. From Robbie Greenfield, the editor of Golf Digest Middle East, and myself, Ben Jacobs, the editor of Sports Talk. Enjoy the tournament and goodbye.